Hello and welcome to today's session where our panel is going to discuss the many ways in which the global pandemic reinforced the need for supply chain fundamentals and really strong supply chain fundamentals. My name is Michael Levins and I'm Group Editorial Director for Peerless Media Supply Chain Group, which of course includes Logistics Management and Supply Chain Management Review Magazines. And I'll be your moderator for this session that's being brought to you by Spinnaker SCA. Well, I don't think I have to remind anyone joining us today that the pandemic effect of the last 18 months has presented unprecedented challenges for supply chain executives. And from what we can see at this point, those challenges don't appear to be lessening anytime soon. Now, the need for supply chain resilience, that's the key word these days, supply chain resilience has certainly picked up steam, reinforcing the need for companies to focus on pragmatic steps to identify, avoid, and ultimately manage through all these disruptions. Now, to take us through some of those steps, we're joined by a panel of Spinnaker SCA experts who are going to highlight key fundamentals used across the supply chain strategy, planning, and execution layers of their client supply chains. And they did that to respond and manage to demand, uh, manage to demand and supply challenges in the face of this global pandemic. Now, let me just quickly walk through today's agenda. Now, in a few, min a few moments, you're going to be meeting today's panel. And from there, our panel will get the ball rolling. They'll be going over the top pandemic supply chain uh, challenges. Then they're going to touch on the importance of developing integrated supply chain capabilities. And then they're going to dive into the best ways to work towards managing uncertainty by putting strategy and design, planning, and execution all to work. And then, of course, keep in mind that we're going to have time for a wrap-up discussion and some Q&A today following the presentation. So please make sure to submit your questions at any time while our panel is going through the presentation today. We're going to get to as many uh, as we can following today's discussion. But if we don't get to your question, don't worry, uh, we can't get, your, get to your question during the allotted time, we're going to move all those questions. We're going to package those up and move them over to our panel, and they'll be able to respond to you via email following today's event. And now I'm just going to turn the podium over to John Sharkey. And John is Chief Operating Officer of Spinnaker SCA. And John is going to get us rolling. Welcome, John. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, for myself and my colleagues, we appreciate the opportunity to talk today. Uh, to start, I'll just give a quick introduction of our firm. So Spinnaker SCA is a focused supply chain consulting firm, and we help companies develop end-to-end -end supply chain capabilities, which means for us, it means spanning from strategy through demand and supply planning and through supply chain execution in areas like distribution, logistics, and omni-channel fulfillment. And so to do this, we work as both business consultants and systems implementers with really a core focus on helping enable better supply chain performance. So the topic of our discussion today, how the global pandemic reinforced the need for strong supply chain fundamentals, grew out of a series of internal discussions that we had about what we've seen in the market over the past year and a half during COVID. But before I get, a, get too far ahead of things, I want to take us stop for a minute and introduce our panel. My name is John Sharkey, as you said, and I, I lead our consulting and services organization, as well as overseeing our sales and marketing operations. Joining me today are, are three great colleagues. I'll start by introducing Joel, Joel Garcia. He's our senior vice president and leads our supply chain execution services. And Joel is an expert in omni-channel distribution and logistics, and he'll be our panel discussant focused on supply chain execution. Next, we have Nick Ham, who's our vice president of supply chain design and analytics. And Nick and I will discuss supply chain strategy and design topics. And finally, we have Debbie Johnson, who's vice president of our supply chain planning here at Spinnaker, and is a subject matter on our panel for su the supply chain planning discussion. Before we get started, I'll just set the stage by spending a couple minutes talking through the key challenges we see facing all companies today. As you mentioned, it's really an interesting time for supply chain management, as the topic has certainly moved from, you know, kind of department level conversations in big companies to a board level conversation. And really, for the first time ever, I've seen you know, it's on the cover of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, if I get in my car at lunch, 
you know, there are stories on NPR. If you watch a White House press conference, supply chain is really everywhere. And it's kind of front of mind for many, many people. As we go through kind of the trends we're going to talk through, we'll highlight, you know, a few quotes that we've gotten from clients in some recent conversations. So the first trend we're going to mention is just really the, the accelerating change in customer expectations. During a recent conversation with the VP of merchandise planning for one of our apparel retail clients, you know, she commented to me that, you know, the change we saw coming is just now coming much, much faster. I've really heard, you know, variants of this statement from a lot of clients, but especially in the consumer facing retail space, the, the speed of change is just really, really dramatic. The next topic we talk about is volatile demand and supply. You know, the quote in this case comes from the chief supply chain officer of a client of ours and really speaks to the difficulty predicting demand at the same time as their Asian, you know, their Asia supply chain is, is really getting highly constrained. You know, this company works in the building product space and they've definitely been in the news, you know, the industry, not necessarily this company. Um, but to, to speak to some of the challenges they saw, they saw, a few months of you know, demand dropping at the beginning of COVID by almost 50%, followed by demand spiking you know, 40% over historical levels for about six months. And all of this happened at the same time that you know, lead times from Asia went up by 50%. Uh, container costs were four to five X what they've been paying in the past. And while it's maybe an extreme example, it's, it's definitely the types of challenges and you know, swings in demand and supply that we've seen in many industries. And then finally, and this one isn't really a new topic, but there's an, still the ongoing and probably more intense shortage of talent in supply chain, you know, really spanning both white and blue collar workers. So whether companies are looking for planners or analysts, whether they're looking for, you know, production or distribution workers, or, or you know, certainly in areas like truck drivers, it's hard to get talent. So at the same time, supply chains have gotten, you know, more complex and difficult to manage through COVID, the finding the right people to help do so has gotten increasing, increasingly difficult. These challenges create, you know, a bit of a perfect storm. So what we've tried to lay out here is that, you know, for companies that aren't ready, the problems in the physical supply chain and the sh shortages buying materials, transporting product, and managing production are really compounded when they don't have visibility to the data on the state of their supply chain or the processes, the systems, and the people to quickly digest that data and make good business decisions. We've highlighted a few of the pain points on this slide, and whether our clients are retailers, CPG companies, food and beverage manufacturers, you know, consumer electronics, or semiconductor or chemical, we're really seeing and hearing a lot of these same problems really across the board. So next we'll pivot to how we think about addressing, or at least better managing, some of these challenges. So at Spinnaker SEA, we play in what we call three different layers of the supply chain. We think about strategy and design, planning and execution, and we'll, we'll structure these discussions around these different areas. So I'll just give a quick summary of what we mean. On the strategy and design side, we think about the physical network structure of the supply chain and really the business rules that govern how the supply chain should operate. This includes identifying suppliers, locating and sizing manufacturing capacity, positioning inventory and defining our distribution strategy, and then thinking about how we service our customers. In the planning realm, we work with companies to forecast and predict demand, and then translate that back through the supply chain to develop purchasing, manufacturing, distribution, and inventory plans across their end-to-end -end network. COVID has certainly shown the importance of being able to look at demand and supply in an integrated fashion across network, and it's really not okay anymore for anybody to just kind of look at local problems, develop a local answer, and then throw the, the answer over the wall to the next level in the supply chain. We really have to think about things at the network level. It's also been really easy to see the difference in outcomes between companies with good integrated end-to-end -end business planning processes and those that don't. And then finally, we'll talk about execution. So the blocking and tackling of, you know, buying, making, and moving product through the supply chain to fulfill demand. You know, really perhaps the first area where we saw COVID drive rapid change was in the requirements for omni-channel capabilities in retail. You know, suddenly things like 
buy online, pick up in store, and curbside capabilities were really, really critical for companies, you know, continuing to operate their businesses. And as the pandemic extended, we've seen, you know, more broader executional challenges kind of up and down the supply chain. So we'll talk a little bit more about those. Before we start, I just wanted to make a couple of quick observations about, you know, how we think about these levels and how they interact, specifically during COVID. The first is that you just can't take it for granted that strategic decisions or planning decisions can be executed upon. You know, uncertainty and execution is real and you, companies really need to have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. And they really need to understand kind of the tripwires and criteria for when you pivot from one approach to the other. The second is that everything is on the table. You know, managing your product portfolio, your pricing, and which customers and market segments get satisfied. These are topics that were not always included in supply chain analysis, but when push comes to, su to shove, you know, they're now open for discussion and they sh always should be. So Nick, Debbie, and Joel will, and I will get into some, some of these topics. So without further ado, let's dive into the discussion. So in this session, looking at supply chain design strategy and design, I'll be talking with Nick Ham. So Nick's background involves about 15 years of supply chain strategy and modeling work, and he's an expert in network strategy. We'll talk about you know, the following three different topics. So the first really focused on supply chain risk and understanding your supply chain to know where risk to lie. Next, revisiting your supply chain design to mitigate risks and enable flexibility. And then finally, think about you know, shaping demand and supply to respond to dis disruptions. Nick, any any comments? That's an interesting time. Let's uh, let's dive in. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so our first topic is focused on understanding your supply chain so you can manage risk. Risk, Nick. Uh, so where do you want to start on this topic? Well, for this topic, uh, we're not talking about modeling the supply chain at this point. We're really talking about understanding the upstream supply chain, where the materials come from, who the suppliers are, where, how diverse is the supply base, etc. Um, so there's some industries like food and beverage, apparel and footwear, and some electronics uh, component manufacturers where the upstream supply chain has gotten a lot of focus due to food safety, worker labor conditions, etc. And these, uh, these companies were generally ahead of the curve um, in some other industries you know, with longer lead times and less focus on the supply base, like for example, some CPG good companies that we've worked with or uh, some industrial product companies. Um, the inputs are a little bit more, you know, commodities, and the supply base hasn't been scrutinized as much. Um, and they, they don't go through cycles, you know, as quickly as, let's say, apparel or semiconductor manufacturers. So, the, you know, the problems are coming, but uh, maybe just not as quickly as they did in some of those other industries. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, you know, from what I've seen in industries like high tech, where I happen to do a lot of work, you know, they've, they've had recent disruptions. You have, you know, issues like the flooding that happened in Thailand, you know, several years ago. The earth, there was an earthquake and the tsunami in Fukushima. You know, they that really sort of disrupted things. But as a result, these companies have looked at, you know, into these kind of upstream issues and gotten more ready to deal with problems. You know, they might not have mitigate, mitigated the problem, so to speak, um, they may have, and maybe they didn't, but at least they knew where the risks lie and they could, uh, you know, respond more quickly to address problems when they occurred. You know, example, I, I think going back to a recent client conversation about this type of responsiveness was a, you know, a friend who's a VP at a global manufacturing, you know, happened to manufacture products that were deemed essential uh, for healthcare reasons. And during the pandemic, they, the story you relayed to me was, you know, a tier two supplier there was a relatively low-tech sheet metal fabricator in Asia that was shut down by local authorities because it was, you know, deemed inessential. When they did this, you know, the local authorities obviously had didn't have any idea where the sheet metal products eventually went and that they did go into some, you know, critical upstream products. And because the manufacturer was able to quickly identify the problem, you know, in pretty pretty quick time within, you know, Inside of a week, they, they worked with the authorities, they were able to open the sheet metal supplier, and they were able to receive these critical components. 
you know, if they were a less knowledgeable or less prepared organization, they may have drained all the inventory in their network and before finding this problem and probably heard, you know, some significant delays. Yeah, and the cold weather impacting the petrochemical industry is another great example of this. Um, punchline really is the companies uh, that actively manage and monitor their supply base and strategically evaluate multiple sourcing uh, and just simply know what's going on have such an advantage in terms of identifying potential problems and addressing them proactively before they become showstoppers. All right, thanks, Nick. Let's uh, jump on to topic number two. So topic number two is looking at, you know, kind of modeling and using digital twins to manage your, your supply chain. So this, this is obviously a sweet spot for your team. So maybe, maybe give us a sense for, you know, what do we mean by digital twin and how do companies use these models during the pandemic? So um, that's a great question. Um, so network modeling has been uh, been around for for quite a while, but companies are you know relying on it more and more and going into more and more detail. So, um, and one of the key things that we're seeing is it's not uh, just you know creating a digital twin to get one answer for your supply chain um, process. Um, it says this is the optimal answer. Like that, that alone isn't enough anymore. So you also have to determine um, sort of what are the conditions um, around that optimal answer, and, and you know, what, uh, when is the the optimal answer no longer optimal? So to do this, you look at uh, scenarios that, and you change key inputs or levers until you hit what we call uh, like trip wires that change the answer. By change the answer, we mean look at a different network structure than the than the current optimized one. So, an example of this would be uh, if you're looking at customer-facing distribution centers. Um, and in general, you know, the closer you are to your customer base with uh, with those DCs, the lower outbound cost it, you're going to have to serve them because you have to drive fewer miles to to service them, assuming you're shipping full trucks. However, uh, the more DCs you have, the higher your fixed costs, the higher your labor costs, the higher your inventory costs. Um, so it's a trade-off, right? You try to find the right balancing point between, um, you know, the number of DCs and reducing your outbound footprint versus, you know, the overhead of maintaining them. Um, and this is a, a great example where a tripwire comes in where we'll take a, a model lever like the transportation spend, the outbound transportation spend, uh, and it just keep, you know, use the model and increase it and increase it and increase it until we hit the point where, let's say, if you're using five distribution centers in North America, it would make sense to have a six or make sense to have a seventh. And what the real value of that is, is knowing um, whether you hit that point if transportation costs go 20% higher or if you have to go 4x higher in order to hit that, uh, that sort of tripwire. And uh, COVID in particular, you know, uh, we're working with customers now that have seen a 4x increase in transportation costs in, in this year alone. So um, it's not, you know, it's it's the type of analysis that having the sort of digital twin and, you know, enabled um, can let you, you know, put together scenarios that may have seemed outlandish or you just sort of prepared for. Um, and what's true of this, like, more straightforward example just holds true across the entire supply chain where it's not as uh, intuitive to understand the relationship between the two things. So it applies to all those key levers that make up sort of the end-to-end -end cost, whether it's the inventory holding cost, the inbound supply, uh, et cetera. And then on top of that, it's not just the costs in the model that you have to consider. It's the reliability and redundancy of your supply chain as well. This is another area where digital twins can really help, you know, flesh out things in that scenario uh, exploration process. So, um, I mean, COVID has really exposed the need for a strong second source for procured parts or distribution and manufacturing. Um, but that redundancy has a cost, right? Um, and so you can use the digital twin to quantify what that cost is and identify sort of weak points in your network structure and figure out where you would want to make the investment to uh, for that redundancy, right? Because leaving yourself open to a single sourcing uh, spot has a high risk, which, you know, people are all coming to, you know, it's coming to fruition now in a bunch of different supply chains. 
So the pandemic's really helped highlight um, where that, uh, you know, sole sourcing from China um, or others, you know, places can pose a pretty significant risk. Um, and we started seeing this even before COVID with uh, some of the trade war tariff rhetoric. And, uh, and now, I mean, with the pandemic, sort of the floodgates have opened. I think the key point, too, um, is some companies had this capability in-house and were able to, you know, pivot it. And now, you know, some people are kind of building the car uh, while trying to drive it. And um, it, it's, a, it's a really exciting, you know, area. And uh, it's something that we're uh, really, you know, excited and seeing some really good results with the companies we're working with. Yeah, so certainly the, the ability to sort of have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C and, and do analysis quickly um, definitely echoes through this topic. So moving to kind of our, our third topic in the supply chain strategy bucket, this, this one's really, you know, one of my favorites. I, I did some work in, in grad school with, with P&G, and it's just an area that, that fascinates me. So this topic kind of goes back to the point of everything being on the table in terms of optimizing business outcomes. So on the, on the demand shaping side, we use a framework called the four P's of marketing, which is, you know, as, as its name implies, typically more of a marketing uh, framework. But it, it looks at the, the price, the product assortment, promotions, and placement, which is a, another way of saying inventory levels. It works with four P's. And, you know, it gets us into different levels we can pull it to manage the supply chain and manage demand, um, especially if, if supply is constrained. Do you want to maybe talk about that a bit, Nick? Yeah, for sure. So for pricing and profitability, um, from an analytics and modeling perspective, you know, we've seen the demand um, for these landed costs and profitability models just, you know, go through the roof. Um, and it's gone from a nice to have to a must have as, you know, pricing in particular becomes one of the key levers that you know, the external markets using to control um, control things, as well as internally how we're regulating supply chains and trying to buffer out um, things as the, the pandemic rages through. So um, on the product assortment side, um, that really ties into uh, skew rationalization topics that we've been you know seeing and people have you know brought up in studies quite a few years, but now has become a a really key focus. So. A large assortment, you know, clearly raises complexity and has its costs, and those costs of complexity and supply, you know, with uh, the limited supply chain, um, you know, really start to shine. So um, the benefits of simplifying your assortment um, really got sort of renewed focus as, you know, the pandemic rolled on. So typically, if you look at, like, a traditional ABC XYZ analysis and follow the eighty twenty rule, you have a long tail of lower volume products that make it more volatile, um, which leads to more inventory and costs than they require uh, and take up more labor to ship, make, you know, except all the all the inputs to it, right? And now that we're in this labor constrained environment, um, especially as the pandemic wears on, um, you really want to make sure that you're not spending labor time doing changeovers for low running SKUs and that you're building full trucks. Um, and not uh, viewing those things. So teaming up sort of the marketing aspect with sort of the supply chain capabilities has been like a key thing that we've uh, we've really seen. Um, so people are trying to get those mixed trucks and LTL shipments down um, by consolidating some of those long tail SKUs. And, uh, and during the pandemic, many companies, you know, rightly so, decided to essentially cut these SKUs um, and prioritize higher volume and more predictable uh, SKUs that could be, you know, executed more efficiently. Um, and I think from a customer perspective, it's safe to say that like having 20 variants of your favorite soda may have been less of a priority. Um, you know, people are happier, you know, just happy to have something on the shelf, even if it's fewer choices. Um, I'm sure, you know, as the bottlenecks um, release, you know, a lot of differentiation will come back for, you know, trying to capture market share with SKU proliferation, but we'll be interested to see, like, how much it bounces back. Um, from the promotion side, um, it seems like the levels have reduced uh, overall, and to the extent they're happening, it's focused on the core SKUs um, 
or clearing out sort of like end of life products where this is a great opportunity to move some inventory that may have been sitting around for a while. Um, but promotions, you know, that the are sort of volatile by their nature and adding them when the supply is already constrained is sort of the, you know, not a top priority. Um, and then for the, uh, the final feed, like the placement and, you know, inventory uh, levels have likewise gotten a lot of scrutiny. Um, with inventory, you know, tight focus on it and making inventory available to sell. Um, I believe it, you know, it's a topic that we're going to hit um, later in the session, but it's certainly been the focus of, uh, of these models as well. Okay, thanks, Nick. Well, you've, you've certainly identified, you know, a few key capabilities that I've seen provide benefits to our clients during the pandemic and really, you know, beforehand and foreshadowed a few, foreshadowed a few topics. You know, I'll be talking about with uh, Debbie and Joel. With that, let's move on to supply chain planning. So next I'll be talking with Debbie Johnson. Debbie has a, a long career helping companies improve supply chain capabilities, and she's a specialist in advanced planning solution, having led many, many uh, transformations. Uh, as really a bit of a planning guy myself, I've been looking forward to this part of the conversation, we've got three good topics teed up. Looking at, you know, the use of POS or consumption data, capacity planning, and demand supply balancing. We've had a lot of experience working with clients to improve their planning capabilities, and I'd be interested to get your, your perspective starting this topic, Debbie. Yes, thank you, John. And certainly our conversations with clients, um, new and old, continues. And I think the themes I would like to call out is Although it's a time of disruption from the pandemic, it's also a time of positive disruption from advances in technology. So really it's a time of change. And of course, change leads to opportunity for our customers. And those opportunities are various, but they include the opportunity to update and refine their planning processes, to build in re resilience and improve visibility across the supply chain, opportunity to enhance and update data. And I would say data is certainly the new oil for supply chain planning. Um, internal and external data, um, which includes customer intelligence, competitor intelligence, market intelligence, it's an asset that tends to have been very underappreciated in terms of sharing with trading partners across the supply chain. I also see it as an opportunity to learn from different industries that have weathered the pandemic successfully, and as well as leverage newer technologies to enable real-time transactions um, that give us visibility in analytics. And uh, lastly, I'd like to call out, it's an opportunity to focus on collaboration, both internal collaboration cross-department and external collaboration with our trading partners. The, the, the beauty of collaboration, it makes us all stronger and more resilient for a new future. Okay, thanks, Debbie. So with that, let's, uh, let's dive into it. So topic number one, um, you know, we use, we use the term point of sale consumption here, but I think the, the real principle we're trying to promote is using data as close to the point of consumption as possible to get the best picture of demand. So I, I, I'd say I feel like this principle has been around a long time, Debbie, and, you know, certainly topics like the bullwhip effect aren't new, uh, but what are you seeing and what's changed, Debbie? I think some retailers and certainly other supply chain partners have made larger strides in terms of, of sharing granular consumption data than others. And they, those have done much better from a resilience perspective through the pandemic than those who haven't shared. On the manufacturer supplier side, there's definitely a wide range of capabilities in terms of the ability to ingest and use this data. But even when companies have the data, there's opportunity to improve processes to leverage it and use it to turn um, knowledge into decision making. Yeah, it always shocks me that kind of knowing the, the, the really bad decision companies, companies can make when they, they don't understand consumption 
you know, I'm, it surprises me that, you know, more progress in using consumption data has, has really gone so slow. I, I know definitely, you know, some companies that use this data really, really well, um, on the other hand, but would you like to share a few of the, the positive stories? Yes, and I think some of these stories started in the early 2000s. And I think one of the first I'd like to call out is a <clears throat> a large European grocery company with a base in the northeast of the U.S. They tri trialed sharing consumption data with their suppliers to improve the overall profitability and success of promotions for both parties. So it was a collaborative effort. The initiative was so successful, it remains in place today and is one of the initiatives a number of retailers are trying to copy. Um, the good news is that technology is advanced, so the support for this is now improved to what it was in those days. On top of that, um, one of the uh, top two hardware companies, retailers in the US, uh, partnered with a number of their suppliers, but specifically wanted to call out a supplier of white goods. And they started collaborating, I would say, early in the 2000s as well, sharing demand forecasts. And that retailer has a good history of sharing data for collaboration now across many trading partners. And the largest retailer in the world really sets a great example of sharing point of sale data. They share point of sale with many of their suppliers to help improve service levels and help improve availability for their customers. One lesson that can be learned from another industry here is it's also really common for in the high tech industry for OEMs to share highly accurate consumption data with their suppliers so that the whole supply chain is aligned. This is something that could be learned from by others in other industries. Additionally, demand sensing, um, which is a forecasting approach that I believe came of age during COVID. It was a new technology, but it's proven itself as the icing on the cake um, on top of point of sale in, in terms of providing, I would say, better results for companies who already use point of sale. So adding macroeconomic data, social data, market intelligence, is really helping these companies to pick up trends in the marketplace. We saw this with our discussions with a large uh, furniture manufacturer earlier this year. Thanks, Debbie. So, you know, just one, one final comment I guess I'll make here is that looking at POS and consumption data, you know, it really doesn't have to be overly complicated. It doesn't need to be rocket science. You know, demand sensing and store level consumption data, that's, that's all obviously great, but really just even, you know, aggregate data and simple analytics to look at, say, you know, weeks on stock, weeks of stock on hand in, with your retail partners can give you a powerful signal. You know, so if, if weeks of stock are trending low, your customer will probably order more, and if weeks of stock are trending high, they'll probably order less. But, you know, this is a really simple analysis to do at that level, and it can really be kind of you know, a canary in the coal mine in terms of what's coming in the future if you're a, you know, supplier into the retail channel. Totally agree, John. With that, let's make, yeah, with that, let's jump into our, um, you know, we've, we've talked a bit about the demand side. Let's jump into key capability number two, which is, you know, let's talk about capacity and supply planning. Yeah, I, traditionally capacity planning is focused on rough, rough cut planning translating that into factory line scheduling. They've not really taken um, labor into account as a constraint in this planning because labor's um, always been assumed to be readily available. But what we see today is different. Labor is an issue for production, for distribution, and for transportation. So combined with the new challenges in terms of getting raw materials, it really reinforces the need for constrained planning. We've seen the need for companies to replan constantly just to keep their factories busy every day. Um, one client we've been talking to recently is replanning their factory lines three times a day. 
using Excel. And I'm sure they're not alone in this process. Constrained supply planning has been available for a long time, but it's often not been implemented or not well implemented or not well understood. And too many companies have plans that aren't feasible. But constrained supply planning has become the new must-have for an unpredictable future. Yeah, this this one fascinates me as well because you know I I see it just as such a huge difference across industries. You know, I, I mentioned kind of high tech and semiconductor industry earlier, and you know I'd rate constrained supply planning in that industry as you know mature and really considered a core capability. So. You know, the, the best companies can replan their end and supply chain daily based on very recent demand signals. And, you know, they operate on very short production time fences. So, you know, one to two days from now, I'm turning my plan into when I'm building and executing on the shop floor and shipping around the world. And, you know, they've managed to figure out how to do that with little to no manual, you know, intervention in a very complex supply chain. Um, so being able to kind of run the plan and execute the plan and if something like labor is a constraint, you know, they're going to figure out how to model that in and be able to run and execute seamlessly uh, while factoring that in. Um, I, I, see, I think we see more and more interest in this topic across our client base. And while I'm not going to say that, you know, in the end, everyone is, is selling widgets and um, their supply chains are the same, you really do see, you know, companies trying to say very much, solve very much the same type of problems, you know, across these different industries. So with that, we'll, we'll jump into our last capability within planning, which is, you know, SNOP and the ability to do demand supply balancing quickly. And so the question I kind of have here, Debbie, is, you know, at the SNOP level, is monthly SNOP enough? <laughs> and I would say a definite no to that, John. <laughs> I would say that weekly SNOP is needed. Demand and supply chains are changing so rapidly. At many companies, uh, as I said earlier, multiple times a day. And those companies with good processes and modern planning solutions can react in times of change and make fast decisions. Weekly SNOP is a must for companies that want to react to the market. And even daily updates, if companies can do it, so do you think that applies for the entire SNOP cycle? Would you say, you know, the same thing on kind of the demand and, and the supply side, or how would those differ? Well, weekly demand is becoming the standard. I know historically a lot of companies took several weeks to do their demand plans due to timely batch runs and data lags. Um, but that view is really dated today. If, if we could use point of sale and external data, um, if those sources are incorporated, the demand plan can change so rapidly. I mean, we saw social media um, sentiment change the trends during the pandemic. We saw it create spikes in the demand for different products. Um, and those trends, we need to be able to react to them. Um, panic trends, um, buying trends, and I mean, at the moment, social media talking about the dearth of products potentially for this Christmas, causing people to go out and buy today. So companies are looking to be able to respond more quickly. On the supply side, I believe you can respond even more quickly than on the demand side. If you have the end-to-end -end constrained supply planning combined with a cohesive control tower, and by that, I mean a control tower that's part of your same platform. Um, you, you can really make real-time updates. You have more agility, and you have the ability to react very quickly, which is a very powerful weapon against your competitors. And I'd like to pick up on a point that you and Nick discussed earlier regarding um, including sales and marketing data in supply chain decision-making. Tools that enable the cross-functional collaboration combined with meaningful analytics and the ability to make those real-time updates are a critical capability to gain buy-in at company-level SNOP. So many of us are working remotely or semi-remotely these days, 
and using those types of tools will really help make good overall business decisions rapidly that everyone can buy into. Yeah, and finally, a kind of an interesting conversation I've had with almost every customer I've talked to recently, is, and it kind of spans this cross-functional decision-making topic is, you know, how do you manage allocation to situations? What I mean by that is I don't have enough supply, and instead of just saying whoever, you know, whoever shows up first and in a first-come, first-served type of model, I'm going to give it to them, it means in allocation planning that I need to hold back some of my supply for certain customers. You know, this, this is a problem that, again, you know, many high-tech te manufacturers who go through really, really intense periods of constrained supply are very good at and have gotten used to. Um, but it's, it's a problem that I see in almost every industry that we talk to right now, and that spans, you know, even CPG, food and beverage, um, apparel, furniture, um, pr pretty much everyone is trying to kind of grapple with this problem. And it's, it's kind of an interesting problem that spans, you know, the, the planning side of things in terms of who do you plan to sell it to and bleeds definitely a bit into, you know, how, how do you promise supply, which is one of the first topics I'll talk through with Joe. Joel, so I should just pause here. But thanks, Steph, thanks uh, Debbie, for talking through these, these few topics. Okay, so jumping into the, the supply chain execution portion of the discussion, I'll next be talking with Joel Garcia. You know, similar to Nick and Debbie, Joel has a long career helping companies improve supply chain performance. Um, but I would say really of the, the four of us on the call, he actually has the broadest you know, background in terms of strategy, planning, and a, really a very deep execution uh, experience. And so the, the three topics that Joel and I are gonna talk through are, you know, making and keeping promises to customers, a bit about the rapid growth of kind of the, the business to, to consumer market, and then, you know, finally, cost and efficiency management, especially in, in light of COVID. So, Joel, looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. All right, let's, uh, let's dive into it. So, our, our, our first topic is uh, making and keeping Promises. What does this mean to you as a supply chain professional, Joel, and maybe as a consumer? Well, you know, um, really, as, as a as a consumer, what we want what we want to do is is have our, you know, the the people we buy from uh, execute or deliver the products that we buy when they say they're gonna they're gonna do that for us, right? And when you think about e-commerce, you know, what I think about is uh, I hate to bring um, Amazon into the, the conversation because everybody does, but they do teach us uh, an interesting point uh, around Prime because Prime, you know, when we spend the money yearly to, um, to be part of Prime, really all we're doing is buying a promise, right? We're buying a promise that we will get our, our goods um, shipped for free and in two days. And if and if they didn't keep that promise, we probably wouldn't uh, participate in that, and it wouldn't have the white success that it does. So, in terms of e-commerce, um, direct to consumer, really what the customer is looking is for is is for you to keep that promise, right? Um, give clear visibility onto when that when that will arrive, and it doesn't have to be speed. It it, it can be um, two days, three days, four days sometimes. And today with Today, with uh, the constraint in supply, sometimes it is uh, an extended lead time, and I believe that customers are okay with that as long as it arrives in the time that you you said it would arrive. Now, if you're a if you're a manufacturer, sometimes lead times are much longer; they could be three or four months. But nonetheless, a, a customer still expects you to clearly state that lead time, and and then keep that that promise when when you do, right? So another topic we wanted to talk about here was, you know, supply chain visibility, which, you know, in some sense is just providing a more detailed view into the, the status of, of something that your customer has on order. You know, if companies always hit their lead time, I don't know that I would be too worried about visibility. Um, but I do want visibility when I don't trust the information that I've been given. So what, what do you see in this space, Joel? You know, yeah, John, that's a good question in that, and that we're finding more and more that our customers want 
visibility through the progress of the order, right? They want to know when it, you know, that you, they, they want to have you acknowledge the order. Uh, they want to know that you're processing the order, that it's in, you know, out for delivery, it's delivered, et cetera, right? They, they, we, we know now that that's an expectation specifically in e-commerce. And we used to have a lot of tools internally to, ma to manage our, our sales progress, right? Uh, orders internally, is it in WMS? Um, have we processed an order? Um, and, and those tools were, were, were great, but visibility tools now have to be used end-to-end, -end, and primarily because we know that there's a variability in the supply chain. I mean, there, there's always gonna be variability, and some of that variability can be eliminated. Um, some can only be controlled. But, but I know for a fact that you can't do either of those if you don't have visibility into that variability, right? So whether it's variability in your supply, variability in your demand, and variability in the process that you're using to fulfill those orders, you, you need visibility to it in order to eliminate it or control it. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, certainly bad news doesn't get better with age, right? Um, what, what do you see on the technology side of things? Do you see, you know, companies using technology well for these problems? They are, and, and you know, from a from a perspective of variability, um, we, we're emerging in that, right? In that, as as we become more connected and use more applications, um, I, I don't know yet of of a of technology that can that can aggregate all the inputs and outputs. Um, universally, right, across all applications to give you a single view of the supply chain. There are some there are those that are emerging. Um, you know, I think about companies like Turbo or Banyan that are, there are in a sense control towers. You know, Debbie made a point that you have to have a good control tower that's that's in the application or in your platform. But as we look, if we look broader than that, there aren't a lot of tools yet that have cross application or universal connectivity to um, carriers, uh, factories, um, you know, cloud applications, but they are emerging, right? And, and some, so the, those that are adopting them early um, are, are seeing some, some results from them, right? And, and as they apply, as, as you get that connectivity and you see the visibility as we start to apply uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to that, to that visibility, then you're really getting to the next step. Got it. Well, let's let's jump into our next topic, um, you know, which has clearly been a focus during the pandemic, which is, you know, the expansion of business to consumer uh, experiences and, and omni-channel. So as as we get into this area, Joel, what, where do you, how do you want to kind of tee it up? I mean. You know, obviously, as people haven't uh, visited brick and mortar stores, it's gotten to be even more critical. Um, how do you see, you know, what happened with COVID and kind of post-COVID, how the experience has evolved? Yeah, the experience, the, you know, the experience has become um, even more important. And, and for, for a short while, um, we, did, we, get a, we did get a reprieve from that in that the experience wasn't as important as getting your goods, right? We, we were willing to accept um, longer lead times. We were, we were willing to accept a, a poor experience online. And certainly we didn't have the, the brick and mortar experience anymore for a short while. But so, so we got a little reprieve from that. But, but then the, but I believe that the, the experience or the focus on experience actually has become stronger. Um, partly because we've expanded the the uh, footprint of of digital or or uh, e-commerce into let's say the baby boomer generation, right? Who, who who maybe weren't participating as much in 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 this economy. So now I, I think as we broaden that that footprint, um, we we have a challenge now of of being able. We have a challenge and an opportunity to be able to tailor that experience at least online to a broader audience um, and, and, and grab more market share. Uh, the, the challenge is that how, you know, if we do have uh, a, a varying experiences uh, online, how do we connect or how do we attract that, that experience or create that experience in, in brick and mortar? 
offering. So great opportunities, I think, as, as we to focus on that, but also um, some challenges to, to unify an experience and to, to a broader audience. Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, I think this, it sort of even ties in or sounds similar to the topic Nick and I were discussing about, you know, skew assort, assortment and skew rationalization. You know, I might have been happy with one flavor of cola during the pandemic, but, you know, eventually I'll get back to wanting a broader assortment. So sounds like so, sort of the same thing applies with shopping experiences. Um, how do you see kind of the overall evolution impact the execution portion of the supply chain? Um, you know, as, as uh, you know, I think that the execution portion has to be tightly connected to that experience as well. And I think that that where organizations fail is that they're, they're trying to create an experience online or in brick and mortar, it, it, whatever their identity is, but they fail to align that strategy uh, on the execution side and how they deliver that experience. And, you know, the the world of distribution and transportation are are certainly not as sexy as, as um, uh, retail, but they have a lot of impact on how you execute on the delivery of that, of that promise and the delivery of, a, of that um, experience. So I would, I would recommend that as you, as you think through this and you make adjustments to um, what you want to be and what your identity is online and in the stores and, and what you want the, the uh, customer to experience, that you align that strategy closely with not only your, your, your own execution engines, um, but if you have, if you have uh, logistic service providers, 3PLs, and others that participate in that delivery and that experience, that they're aligned also with, with what you're trying to do. Okay, great. Um, let's, you know, move on to our final topic, which is the, you know, the, the quaint notion uh, that we need to manage costs in the, in the supply chain. Um, you know, so as, as you think about kind of cost, service, inventory, and the experiences of different companies um, during the pandemic, you know, give me a sense for what you've seen. You know, I, I think that if you look at the at the points that we have here, um, I think that the greatest challenge that that, that I'm seeing is, in the, or that I saw during that pandemic, was um, shared inventory, right, or, or managing inventory. Prior to COVID, um, we the inventory challenges were that you know we 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 were trying to position inventory at the right place, at the right time. Um, in the right quantities, and sometimes we got it wrong. Sometimes we got we we uh, placed inventory in a store, and that inventory became uh, unproductive, right? And, and then it was subject to markdowns, et cetera. And we had to bear the expense of moving the inventory um, around, reposition that inventory to try to uh, maintain that margin. But when COVID came. We, we literally had inventory that was trapped, right? We, we saw retailers that did not have a single pool of inventory. Um, and, and, that, and that included, they, they had created silos, not only organizationally, but with technology, with their applications. Um, and, and physically the inventory was, was siloed. So they had inventory that, had, that was trapped. Inventory that was um, sensitive to seasons was trapped in retail stores. And they couldn't expose that that inventory to what was on the opposite side a booming e-commerce business. So, you know, from a cost perspective, from a strategy perspective, um, the the what the the companies that I saw really really managing costs were those that were able to ship quickly or that already had a had a plan to eliminate those um, those uh, inventory silos. I also see I also see um, a, a tremendous shift to man to manage the labor shortage into automation, right? Goods to person, and mm. uh, you know, micro fulfillment is a is a a good example of ways to manage the labor shortage and the shift, right? Interesting. So, kind of the last comment that I see here, you know, in evaluating your logistics service partners. You know, it sounds like something Nick would have talked about earlier. 
Yeah, you know, that's an interesting, that, that's interesting is that traditionally we use logistics service providers or partners in to help us manage um, variability in, in our demand or our volumes, right? Um, if I if I needed more space, I'd go through a 3PL. If I needed more uh, fulfillment capacity, I could go through a 3PL. Or if I needed more transportation capacity, I, I always had more more capacity or more uh, carrier partners that I could engage. But what we've all seen is that is that we're all constrained um, in with labor, right? Whether it's your uh, cloud application provider, they they are likely struggling for developers. Um, you know, there's we have limited space. Everybody's struggling with labor. So it's a good opportunity now to look at your logistics service providers and and work with them to develop a plan on how they're dealing with with um, their constraints and how well they're positioned to service your demand right and, and your challenges so this is an area that i think um, everybody should be looking at and, and not just not just in one area but across the board whether it's edi transportation um, like I said, cloud providers, it, it's, the constraints are everywhere. Okay. All right, thanks, Joel. Well, you know, clearly a lot to talk about, um, and it's been good to get a summary of these key topics. I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to sort of, you know, make a few concluding statements before we do the, the, the quick Q&A. You know, so I think as we look across these layers of supply chain strategy and design, planning and execution, and when we consider how to improve capabilities, you know, we really have to keep in mind that supply chains are complex systems and often to drive real results, you know, it's not the, the problem right in front of you that needs to be solved, but a bunch of different processes and systems and people working together that, you know, span across strategy, planning and execution. So I'll kind of leave it with that. Um, so, you know, obviously we have a lot of passion for these topics and love to work with our clients. Um, we've pr provided a bit of information here if anyone would like to continue the conversation. But with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Michael, uh, for some Q&A. Absolutely, John. Well, John, Joel, Nick, and Debbie, uh, guys, just a terrific job today. Um, sharing so much in, in, insight. And yes, John, I can, I can feel that there's a lot of passion to what you guys are doing and helping and how you're assisting your clients in these difficult times. I just want to let everybody know in the audience, uh, we do have time for a quick Q&A. Um, but if we don't get to your question today, we will be packaging those up and we'll be moving them over to the panel and the guys will be able to get back to you uh, via email with uh, their answers. So actually, I've got a number of questions that have rolled in here, so please keep submitting those questions. We have quite a few, and I'll do my best here to kind of uh, segment these out, and at least we have one per uh, our panelists, uh, one per panelist. So, John, the first question is actually uh, is, uh, geared towards you. A uh, question for John is, uh, John, what are some change management tips that you would suggest to organizations looking to integrate their supply chain strategy, planning, and execution capabilities? What about change man management tips you have? Yeah, so I mean, definitely, change management is kind of the uh, one of the most important enablers of um, you know any any successful transformation. So uh, mm -hmm. I'll probably kind of point out like three different areas. You know, one would be leadership. So you know, strong executive sponsorship is just really critical. Um, the best run companies, you know, they they think about the business case when they do these transformations, but they're all also just they have executive leaders who are really strong believers that. Right. A well-run supply chain is important for the success overall of the company. Um, mm -hmm. Number two, I'd say, you know, a clear roadmap that's going to look at the supply chain transformation holistically across these different layers and, you know, understands mm -hmm. and communicates priorities, strategies, initiatives in a way that, you know, people within the organization top to bottom can understand right. it, uh, understand them. And then, you know, the, the third is just kind of looking at the people side of things and, and making yeah. sure that there's a, a resourcing model that's realistic. You know, some companies mm -hmm. have a ton of talent and they can do these things themselves and get results. And, you know, maybe they just need like software uh, right. implementation support, whereas others, you know, they need more more advice, engineer, process reengineering, technical change management. Um, yeah. So we, you know, we engage with companies in a lot of different ways, uh, depending mm -hmm. upon their internal 
capabilities, but you've got a, you know, successful change kind of, you know, to me, I think these, these three areas are kind of the big priorities. Yeah, absolutely. Great insight. Getting everybody involved. Lots of good communication there. Uh, our next question, actually, this one is, it looks like it's uh, more geared towards uh, Nick. And Nick, I know you uh, you did mention, um, it made reference to the you know, digital twins and the importance that that's playing these days. You know, this question's for Nick. Uh, Nick, what is Spinnaker SCA's experience in companies adopting a digital twin to run scenarios across their uh, supply chain network? What, what, do you, what have you experienced so far there? Yeah, I think it, it sort of is playing out across a bunch of different companies um, mm -hmm. from, that we've seen that um, if they're doing sort of a, the traditional three to five year sort of long-term strategic analysis, that tends mm -hmm. to be a one-off project. Um, they'll build the model, you know, they'll do the analysis, and then when it comes time to do it again in a year or two, they build a new model and, you know, perhaps use different people or, or you yeah. know, Et cetera, and that it's not really, you know, built into a into a that frequent of a use. Um, right. But we've been seeing more and more companies, um, and when we talk about, you know, adopting a digital twin, um, mm -hmm. using the optimization models that they put together uh, and bringing them into their SNOP process, um, right. either to help facilitate sort of uh, capacity planning, maybe at a higher level than they would do. You know, like on you know at an actual plant, but still sort mm -hmm. of across the whole network, um, or just help profile and you know run different what ifs around you know potential demand that could be picked up, um, and you know in that basis that you know they're seeing you know they're refreshing these models on a monthly basis, and by the very act of keeping them um, refreshed frequently, they're they're using them on an ongoing basis. Right, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, it's a really cool new development, and we're going to be watching that quite quite a bit in our pages of Logistics Management and Supply Chain Management Review uh, magazines as well. We're looking for really great case studies there. So that's that's great uh, great input and great insight. We have time for a, a couple more questions. Actually, this one's for Debbie. A little bit more on the technology side, uh, Debbie. There's a question from one of our one of our attendees. Uh, Debbie, uh, how are you seeing investments in technology aid organizations in supply chain planning imperatives? What, what are you seeing? Great question. Um, we're seeing those organizations that are making investments in the in the latest supply chain planning technologies are better able to cope with with supply chain disruptions such as the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And our new normal calls for several must-haves, and I'll just list these out for you sure. quickly. So um, the first one, demand sensing and point-of-sale data. We talked about, about that a little earlier yep. on, but mm -hmm. companies that have implemented demand sensing and leveraged point-of-sale data can certainly detect trends much earlier than those who don't. And it mm -hmm. gives those companies more time to respond and respond more successfully. Mm -hmm. um, we talked uh, the second one uh, integrated control towers with real time planning. Companies with cohesive control towers and planning solutions have earlier visibility to supply chain issues and can make those real time planning decisions. Mm -hmm. And then the power of what if. Um, we've long talked about the ability to run scenarios, but that hasn't been available to everyone. And now we have the ability to run scenarios for SNOP, for demand, for supply and production. And again, giving people the ability to react to changes very quickly and run those um, scenarios. Um, and then the automated supply chain resolution and management. This is something that's fairly new, but the ability to highlight exceptions, provide feasible solutions, or an approach that incorporates, you know, incorporates trade-offs between cost and service level, and then um, learns from those um, trade-offs that you make. So, mm -hmm. employing your AI and your ML there is something that we see. And then, of yeah. course, what we talked about earlier, balancing demand and supply, is really imperative for the SNOPs to run on right. a, a more frequent basis. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, we're, sure, we're certainly seeing those integrated control towers really expanding these days as well. We've been covering that quite a bit as well. Uh, great input and great insight, Debbie. Thank you. And we do have time for one more 
question, and we do going to have to. We're going to have to wrap up our session today. So again, if your question has been asked, uh, please, uh, we'll, we'll get right back to you with those answers. We are capturing all the questions today, and we'll be getting back to all the attendees. This last question uh, looks like it's more geared towards uh, Joel and Joel's uh, s- uh, section in today's panel. Question for Joel: For for organizations that are midstream in their omni-channel journey, where would you focus your resources in the next two years? That's a that's a great question, Joel. What do you think about that? Yeah, you know, um, it, it is a good question. And you know, if you're midstream uh, in your in your omnichannel journey, um, likely you've, you've already um, dipped your you know dipped your toes into into this uh, strategy and are finding are, are learning a lot from it, right? So, I would focus on inventory. You know, I I, I Previously commented on how inventory is incredibly important. It could be the largest capital expense uh, that you have, and and when you get it wrong, it could you know mean uh, tremendous expenses and repositioning in inventory. Mm-hmm. So I would continue to to focus on that and, and ensure that it's aligned to your omni-channel, not just not just digital but cross-channel. Right. And I also think that those that are that are midway through are likely finding that their planning systems. Are struggling to keep up with, uh, say, an unpredictable OMS sure. um, order yeah. management system, right? That makes you know, sense. We, we yeah. love the order. We love the order management because they could allocate inventory from anywhere at any time. Um, but it's also, it, it, in some cases, it's um, being disrupted, right? Mm-hmm. And because uh, if we look back at our, our planning, uh, the, the statistical techniques that we used to use are no longer able to manage this complexity. Right. So I would explore implementing um, AI and machine learning techniques to analyze the you know and predict the effect of multiple multiple factors such as seasonality, mm-hmm. social media, you know transportation, um, variable demand, uh, and 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 such systems that can do it simultaneously. Right. So yeah, I, that absolutely. would be for me the focus is how to align inventory, how to how to apply predictive analytics to to inventory. Yep, and again, and so much of that available right now. Now, I guess the next step is understanding what you need, harnessing all that that data, and making great sense of it. Well, John Sharkey, Joel Garcia, Nick Ham, Debbie Johnson, guys, just a terrific job today. I want to thank you all for participating in this terrific panel discussion. Now, I also want to thank everybody for attending today. Again, we did get to a, a few questions today. If we didn't get to your question, uh, again, no no fear. Uh, it's going to be moved over to our panel, and the panelists will be able to get back to you with their answers answers uh, directly. So, uh, panel, great job today. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Thanks so much, Michael. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you, everybody. And I want to thank also thank Spinnaker SCA for making this session possible. Well, thanks again, and everybody have a terrific day.